Tu, Mr. Ang is the head of the Cyber Homeland Defense uh, Department at the Center of Excellence for National Security. This is under uh, this is a think tank under uh, the NTU, right? And uh, like Mr. Ang indicated, he's also chief data officer at uh, AI Singapore. So Mr. Ang has had a very um, long and interesting work history. So uh, those who were in earlier, uh, Mr. Ang has been small law firm, large law firm. He was at Raja Antan at one point uh, as a lawyer as well as um, running running office manager. Were you office manager or something else? Yeah, so oh. it was general manager because I was I also had uh, I was a partner at the same time, so I had more power than an office manager. But yeah, yeah. basically and office manager. He was also in charge of the IT infrastructure at some point. Uh, so and he was in a, a startup law firm, right? Uh, in house counsel. Uh, so academic. So Mr. Ang has very very many many talents. Oh, and of course, uh, for those who just joined us, uh, Mr. Ang is also. A, local musician okay so he's part of the band called cosmic armchair uh if you're interested please uh you know uh check out the band's music right so uh but without further ado i think uh i'll, I'll hand the uh, uh time over to mr ang please take the opportunity to to you know to tap mr ang's expertise like i said um he has very many um, a long and interesting history he can give you a lot of insight that um you know you uh not many people would be uh easily give you right um ben by the way uh uh we've got an answer to your questions so i, I don't know I whether think... you want to take it uh now or uh, benedict that's a great question i think we'll i'll go through what I'm going to go through and then I'll answer you right at the end because I think it'll give more context for what I'm talking about. Great. Great questions. Uh, more, look forward to more questions as well. I'm going to start asking... Thank ben. with, thanks oh, a lot, the ben, the other Ben, Ben De Silva, okay. for asking the question. <laughs> okay, but keep it up. So those of you who, who have questions, please take the opportunity. Yeah? Okay, sorry Ben, over to you. Thanks a lot, Kim Woon, and thanks for inviting me to speak. And as I posted in the chat, you can get the slides at my Twitter profile. It's pinned atop my Twitter profile, so you can click on the link and get them. I'm going to ask you all questions right now, get to know you. And kind of want to know what careers are you aiming for? And also, how comfortable are you with technology? So please click on the poll that you see right now and let's see some ideas ah i see people coming in already oh it's heating up yes what career are you aiming for someone to be paralegal someone to go to the legal service prosecution um legal department whatever well, it's quite quite balanced quite balanced oh legal service is pulling ahead law firms are law firms are healthy lawyers yep okay NGOs and civil society, okay. Ah, I see there's a there's legal technology professional. Serena will be happy to hear that. Start own business. Well done. Five entrepreneurs already, I see. Comfort with technology. I see that there's a whole bunch that are really super comfortable. Uh, only a small number are on the not comfortable range. Great, great. I see a lot of response to the poll. I'm going to leave the poll up for another about you know, 15 seconds. Maybe if you haven't like decided what career you're aiming for, you just go with your gut feel. And maybe I'm asking you to uh, tough a question on a Monday morning. Just go with the feel, you know, what do you feel like it? Oh, more people want to start their own business. And a number want to go into non-law corporate careers. Uh, okay, I'm going to give another five more seconds. Um, and then I'm going to end the poll, right? And then you can see the results, okay? So in five, four, three, two, one. And here are the results. Leading is legal service. No, actually lawyer is the most because it's 58%. Um, 
and then followed by 42% wanting to go to legal service, prosecution or ministries. Then legal department in a company and the rest are kind of like, I see quite a number want to be start your own business, entrepreneurs. And comfort with technology, I think you are all at the higher end. You can use it to find solutions and help others with it. So that's the sense of everybody who's in this room today. Thank you all for those who replied to the poll. And today we're talking about what this legal technology means to you. And please take notes for discussion because we're going to have breakout rooms. Uh oh, this guy has breakout rooms. You don't just sit there and you know walk away and leave the sound running and then go and do something else and play games. Or you there's actually take notes for discussion because we're going to actually have a discussion in breakout rooms. Yeah, sorry, you know, I was a lecturer uh, at, in TP before, and some habits are still there. Okay, so take notes. How can you use legal tech in your future career? I want to tell you a story, the story of Fiona. Fiona's on maternity leave. She wants to start a business matching freelancers to clients, right? Because a lot of people are freelancers in gig economy and they're investors who want to invest in a business. Sounds classic, she should need a lawyer, right? Instead, she gets her shareholders agreement from an online source rocket lawyer who can a legally trained friend, maybe one of you, can help her to check that the template applies in Singapore and the investors sign. So she doesn't need a lawyer for her investors. What about the freelancers who want to sign up with them? She downloads a freelancer's agreement from a Singapore site and the freelancers sign. So in two instances, she's got serious contracts, the foundation of a business, and she hasn't had to go to a law firm. And this is how people are doing business. Now, for those of you who want to start your own business, hey, you are even an advantage because you actually understand the law to some extent. Huh? And you, those of you who are going to go in-house in legal departments and companies, you say not every situation needs to have a lawyer on hand. So what's the impact? This is all legal tech, right? How could you use legal tech in your future career? So I'm reminding you because some of you zoned out earlier, take notes for discussion because we're going to have breakout rooms. How can you use legal tech in your future career? So please don't be the one in the breakout room who's embarrassed that, hey, what happened, what happened? Uh, do take note, pay attention. And the slides, again, the slides are available at my Twitter profile. So here you are, you're poised on the brink of SIP and after that your career. Lawyers, law firms, and paralegals are standing at a crossroads. They can use tech to succeed, that would be nice, or you can try and fight it, or you, <laughs> or you can kind of like ignore it. And you're going to meet in your SIP, lawyers, law firms, and paralegals who are choosing any one of these three. I have lived this experience. So legal tech, I did not expect legal tech to actually appear throughout my career, but it did. I started as a trainee or pupil in those days. And first of all, when I came into the law firm, which was a small law firm with only uh, 14, 15 lawyers, I was number 15. That small law firm, um, basically, they didn't have much technology. So as a trainee, I went in and I was using computers to find stuff and to do stuff when everybody was still manual, literally manual on typewriters. Okay, that's how long ago it was. And then they realized, wow, hey, this trainee uh, can get things done very fast because he knows how to use technology. So they kept me on as a lawyer. And when they kept me on as a lawyer, I started to think of, hmm, you know, other ways in which we could do things faster. For example, in this small law firm, which was growing, by the way, the name of this law firm was Raja and Tan. So I joined when there was only like 15 lawyers. Then we did this thing called exponential growth, meaning every year we doubled in size, and which is why Raja and Tan is now the largest law firm in Singapore. 
and as we were expanding, I started introducing strange things like, you know what? Maybe every lawyer should have a computer. In those days, it was rare. Maybe every computer should have email, which also was rare because the whole, whole firms used to share one email address. And maybe we can have a server where we can share files because in those days, everybody was keeping things on their own C drive. And because of that, they said, hey, this guy is making a contribution to the firm, make me a partner. And at that point in time, I decided, hey, I wanted to study more about this. I went to get a master's in information systems and an MBA. And then I came back, I became the director of technology, or as we call it nowadays, chief information officer. So I was then in charge of all of the tech of the firm. And we started doing stuff. We started doing stuff like, first of all, we need help desk. So I had to train a help desk to help lawyers. If you've ever helped your parents or grandparents to use technology, you are a help desk. And it's a skill. No matter how good you are at using technology, it's yet another level of skill to explain it to your grandmother, right? Who's got that experience? You can share in the chat. I also want to thank uh, Seth Bo for sharing the link to the slides. That was very helpful, thanks. So, well, I, I, to be fair, I'm not saying this to say I'm contributing a lot to legal tech, but I'm saying that every step that I took helped me in my career. And you, if you are in the, lev, uh, in the state of being comfortable with tech, and being able to suggest ways that people can actually improve the way that they do work. We were coming up with things like databases of legal research that the firm had done. We were coming up with things like how to automate the work that we were doing. So that let's say you want to do an order 14 summary judgment. You don't have to go and like dig and dig and get find it. Somebody will have kept it in a shared folder. I mean, these are not amazing rocket science things, but you'll be amazed how few people don't think about them. And if you think about them, then you have value add. And because of that, I became not just CIO, but also CEO, Chief Operation Officer, or General Manager or Office Manager. So I was heading up the admin team and the HR team. Then I got, well, Ichi, and then I joined my friends to do a startup, startup law firm. And it was in the startup law firm that suddenly I was out of the big law firm environment without all the resources, without the, uh, I must be very grateful to the managing partner at that time, my pupil master, Mr. VK Raja, whom you all will know as Judge of Appeal VK Raja or Attorney General VK Raja. And he was very supportive. And you need to find advocates like that. You need to find a literary advocate. You need to find people like that who are senior and supportive of you because all this stuff costs money. And who likes to spend money if they're not seeing the benefit? But he could see it. He had vision, right? And his other managing partner, Sundresh Menon, whom you now know as Chief Justice Sundresh Menon, also a guy with a lot of vision. So they were able to support all of these projects. But when I came out and I went into a startup, suddenly I realized that there's just like four of us. We don't have money. We had to find low cost ways of getting stuff done. And that's when we had to use more technology, like free software or low cost software and use software to get things done, which in a big law firm, you could use staff, secretaries to get done. And then from there, the startup, things happen, you know, unpleasant stuff happen. One of the partners um, cheated us on money. Um, we reported him to police and he went to jail. Anyway, we, I went, went in-house. And in-house, I was able to 
use a lot of knowledge that I had to be in-house in a software company, after that in a media company. And then I became a legal tech consultant in a legal tech company where we did projects like e-discovery. You've heard from Serena, right? e-discovery, and wow, discovery is no joke. Right? When you go for SIP and you encounter discovery and you're preparing your documents for trial, that is when you want technology. Because without technology, you're just going to be taking stacks and stacks and stacks of paper taller than yourself and putting post-its and photocopying or putting into a scanner. But if you have it all in soft copy, manageable, searchable, and don't take it for granted, huh? you actually need to implement an e-discovery software to do it. If you can, the one, the firm, the party which uses e-discovery effectively has all of the facts and the arguments at their fingertips compared to your opponent who is still struggling, flipping or scrolling, 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 where's the thing, where's the thing, where's the thing. Whereas you have it at your fingertips because you use e-discovery, you know where everything is, which piece of evidence fits every legal argument you're making. That was the, so I was doing that for law firms. Then the great economic crash happened. So we all collapsed. And fortunately, at that time I was adjuncting for TP and TP uh, was had space for me. And I taught at TP for many happy years. And I got to know nice people like Mr. Pang. And uh, so I got to teach tech and law. And now I'm academic at NTU in a research institute called Center of Excellence for National Security, where I give lectures and I write articles about tech and law. And last year I was, I was actually at the United Nations three times to talk on this topic because there aren't that many of us in the world. And part of this is that out of the like 60 plus of you who are here today, maybe only one or two might be really interested in that. But if you are, the opportunities are huge because there's so few of us, right? Now, legal tech enables you to provide better value to anyone who needs the law. Other people are using bicycles, you can fly. So can law firms afford to be complacent? Well, you know, I've seen law firms where Lawyers say, no, we should still do it by the manual way. That's the real way up. You know what? That may not be the place that you want to build your career. Unless you can persuade them to change, maybe you'll make a difference. But otherwise, you might want to think twice about that being the place to have your career. If you are the lawyer, if you are in-house and you're deciding which lawyer to engage, that might not be the law firm you want to engage as well. So here's the situation, right? These are actual stats in Singapore. As you can see, it's a screen cap I grabbed from somewhere. There are a lot of law firms that are really, really interested in this. They see it as an opportunity and a threat at the same time. Opportunity because if you get it right, you can be very successful against your competition. Threat because if you get it wrong, then you're basically bye-bye. You could be wiped out because people don't need a lawyer anymore or a paralegal or a law firm. In-house counsel, the legal department in a company are under pressure to do things and to get that kind of legal help without spending the money that you need to spend in getting a law firm. So let's talk about this. How can you use legal tech? The legal technology vision, which is what this lecture is titled, is the roadmap by Singapore Academy of Law and is driven by our Chief Justice Sundresh Menon for the legal sector, for legal tech providers to reassure that assistance is provided for those who are willing to change. And there's a four-prong approach. Identify the baseline, improve the technology, adapt and innovate, and then invent. The baseline is for law firms or legal departments of one upwards, but less than 100. Above 100, they, have, they should have the baseline at least. This baseline is productivity. Can you imagine people who don't know how to use Word properly? 
There are so many shortcuts in Word for handling large documents. It's crazy. If you know you are way ahead, other people are still typing things manually. You know all the auto functions of Word, do you? The auto functions that lawyers use? Go and find out. Time logging and billing. Can you imagine people are still manually writing down how much time they spend? But you learn things like, you know, um, time logging and billing software. Practice management software. As a partner, I was always concerned how much money is coming in. Where are all the cases? Who's running which case? Is there any conflict when a new client comes in? Is anybody else working for the opponent? The software is there. Otherwise, you've got to do it manually. You've got to go walk around the whole firm and ask people. Your online profile. We were one of the first law firms to have a firm website. Now, if you don't have a firm website, you are basically a non-entity. You don't exist. And if you don't have a LinkedIn account, LinkedIn is like the, the, it's the Facebook or Twitter or Insta of professional people. That's where you put your professional face. If you don't have this a website and a LinkedIn, you don't exist. You're not pro. Communications. Who can survive without Zoom now? Who can survive without Slack? Slack is the professional what professionals use instead of Discord or WhatsApp. Cybersecurity, are you protecting? Law firms are the biggest target because law firms have the lousiest cybersecurity and got all the juiciest confidential documents. So are you protecting? And then legal research. In addition to LawNet, which you must have, are you using things like intellects, AI tools to help you understand your LawNet searches? So, big question that law firms always ask, hey, it costs so much, right? But so many things are online now that you don't need to buy expensive servers. Law firms also can combine and share resources and they can use government grants. The best way to get results, I'd say, is increase IT literacy. And you, if you have, if you are IT literate, you can help in the law firm or legal department that you go to to increase the literacy and then learn the solutions. And change the processes. Don't do things the old, same old way. And watch out for changes to the law because changes are being made to help these things to grow. So that's just the baseline, you know, the baseline. There's still improvements that can be made using shared workspaces. You know Google Docs, Google Slides. There's shared workspaces for the professional level, like Microsoft SharePoint. There's also a document review by AI. If you want to check, go through documents, huge contracts, and you want to understand what these contracts are about, then you don't have to do it by manually. You can use the AI to do it. See, so there's also document assembly where instead of having to write an entire contract from scratch, you use these tools like Hot Dogs and Vanilla Law to auto-generate the document for you. There's also improving access to legal services like Asia Law Network that connects you to clients. There's due diligence. Now, when you want to buy a company or acquire a company or merge with a company, you need to check how they are doing, whether they are safe to buy them or not. So you do the due diligence and there's a lot of documents to analyze. People at One Partnership use AI to do it. And then smarter searches with AI. Do you want to just use your law net search and get hundreds and hundreds of, of, um, of what you might call, uh, hundreds of, of results and you don't know what these results mean? It's instead, intellects helps you understand the searches by using AI to process them. So that's the improvement level, right? Take what you are doing and improve it. Then there's level three. Level three is innovative services. Use data analytics, machine learning, natural language processing, at which point the class begins to split. Some of you are saying, oh man, that's cool. Some of you are saying, oh, these words, don't tell me these words. Okay, so don't worry. If you are in the second category, go and ask the people in the first category to help you. There's so much that can be done. AI can do legal research. IBM has this thing called Watson Rust that does legal research. It's scary because then you think, wow, do I still need lawyers? Outcome assessment. There's these tools, Lex Quanta is in Singapore, they actually can predict how much your matrimonial asset can be split using data analytics. 
and there's the online dispute resolution. So these are tools which you can crunch the huge amount of data that's in legal cases to try and figure out the outcome. And level four is inventing new legal tech. Stuff that we haven't even imagined yet. So I'm not even going to try. So your opportunity is in the different levels. At the baseline level, most law firms need to catch up. And if you're in a law firm that needs to catch up, size one to a hundred lawyers, you can actually be the instrument for change and add value and you become valuable. Improvement? There are many young law firms, when I call it young, meaning that young thinking, not old. Sometimes you go and see the people, they look like they're in their 30s, but mentally they're in their 60s. Or people who look like, wow, they look very old, but wow, their thinking is very advanced. So if they're willing to be advanced, they can improve and they can pull ahead of the competition. What about innovation? The large law firms and Aha, I see my friend Rajesh Srinivasan in the call. So the largest law firms and the international law firms are ahead of the game, right? And I really want to you know, give a shout out to Raja Antan and Raja Antan Technologies. And not just because Mr. Rajesh Srinivasan has just entered the room, but this is definitely large law firms and international law firms are hit. And we talk about inventing startups. There's opportunities because I noticed that there's a number of you who want to be in startups or to start up your own business. There's a lot of opportunities. So here in your breakout groups, I'm going to give you five minutes. How can you use legal tech in your future career? If you look at the slides, you will see that there's this. Right? So I'm going to put, send you around into breakout rooms and for five minutes, you go and just type into the Google slide. You know what to do according to which group you're in. So breakout rooms, um, there's 10 breakout rooms. You've got six or seven in a room and let's go. Here you are. Um, I think I won't need to read out what, yeah. Oh, some, oh, group one still going strong. Okay. You can read each other's because this document is live, right? You can see. Uh, group six, thank you. It is what it is. Profound. You should make a t-shirt. Group eight, group nine, group ten. So feel free to read each other's ideas, okay? Uh, and this was a crowdsourcing concept more than anything. I want to, with those ideas, I now want to introduce a very important guest and I'm very glad that he's able to join us because he's actually in the middle of many meetings. So I'm grateful for his time. And he's also an old friend when we were in Raja Antan together. Rajesh has over 20 years of experience, right? And he advises governments, okay? His clients are not just companies, his clients are governments. And he's an internationally regarded as an expert in the law of telecommunications, computer hardware, software sector, all technology law areas. But not only that, he's also director of Raja and Tan Technologies, which is a very, very unique and innovative entity in Singapore. So I'd like you all to welcome Rajesh. Rajesh, hi. Hey, hi. Just to the um, two up view. To the, yeah. Yeah. Happy to be here. Hey. So Rajesh, thanks for joining us. And I think the first question people want to know is why start up Raja and Tan Technologies? Mm -hmm. What was the idea of, because uh, Raja and Tan is a law firm, everybody knows it, but why start up a technology company? Yeah, sure. I, I don't know whether you want to, it's okay to share slides or something. But, Please you know, do. I'm going to give you access to share slides right okay, now. Cool. Um, you are now co-host. Cool. Let me just um, do this very quickly. Yeah, great. Can you see the, the deck? Yes. Hyper-lawyering, man. <laughs> yeah. It's just our way of, of trying to describe the, 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 the change that has occurred. Um, Hyper-lawyering. 
Yeah, the, the reality is that, you know, all of our traditional responsibilities as lawyers are still there, hasn't gone away. They need to be honest, competent and diligent to ensure confidentiality, our duty towards our clients, duty towards other practitioners and our duties as officers of the Supreme Court. These are all core principles that must never be forgotten uh, as we go down this quest to, to adopt technology. But at the same time, the landscape of practice has changed significantly as well. There's cross-border competition, there's globalization, technology is disrupting, um, clients are getting more and more sophisticated, more demanding. There are new technology stacks like artificial intelligence, smart contracts, blockchains, uh, and every organization is sort of required to sort of adopt and adapt technology to fit their business model. And law is no different from, from that. And really that's what, what, what we're trying to do here to look at how we can best apply law to, to our, our context. So our way of dealing with it is, you know, when you talk about hyper-lawyering, is hyper-responsibility. Because the lawyer today shouldn't just remember the need to be honest, competent, in, and have integrity, for example. Um, you will also have to have technology literacy. You need to find new ways and new tools to, to solve older problems. Your service delivery model has to change. There's a need to continuously collaborate very quickly and rapidly with various organizations and then new pace of working as well. All of this means that, you know, you can't do things the old way. And that's why we've done what we've done. And I'm happy to share some examples. But I'll pause here first and, and ask whether any questions or anything else. Well, since you mentioned the examples, we are definitely curious about the projects that Raja and Tan has run. Yeah, sure. So, so here's one. Um, it's called Lupul. So Lupul is an example of how we've sort of broken beyond the Singapore barrier, the regional barrier, and, and now are playing the technology stack in the international uh, layer. We've invested uh, together with uh, CMS, which is one of the largest, it is technically now the largest law firm in Europe, and Cooley, which is a silicon-based based, uh, law firm, which has been growing very rapidly, uh, no doubt because of the fact that they've invested heavily in companies like Zoom. Uh, on an equity basis uh, for fees, Ooh. very smart thing to do. Fully <laughs> owned shares in Zoom. Uh, yeah, they, they, they basically brought Zoom to, to all the way to IPO on an equity based uh, fee fee uh, arrangement. That's uh, damn which, smart. <laughs> exactly. So you know, uh, yeah. So we are, we are all using Zoom today. So uh, Kuli is is also our partner in this in this project, uh, and Adam Rattenberg there, who was actually the lead counsel for, for Zoom, is is the lead partner working with me uh, together with Duncan Weston. Uh, at CMS and three of us are basically pushing for the, the launch of Lupul. Lupul is going to be the world's first open platform for lawyers, bringing together everyone into a single single environment. The, 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 to be very simply, it tries to solve the problem we're all facing today, which is fragmentation, right? Just to pick one place like, like video conferencing, we're using Zoom today, but in a law firm setting, our clients sometimes insist on using Microsoft Teams, which we also use, or they might ask to use WebEx or BlueJeans or many other platforms that are available for video conferencing today. What we do with Lupul is to make every one of these platforms accessible through a single view. And that includes WeChat and WhatsApp, uh, Messenger, etc. So you wake up in the morning today, uh, I have to go into Outlook and check all my emails and then go into uh, WhatsApp and see all my messages that are there and then pop into WeChat for our Chinese clients. And it's a whole series of different things. And you get instructions flying in from all over the place. You can't manage effectively when this is the case. And yet this is how business is done today. So to manage that risk, we created Lupul, which will be a single view. So what we have done is gone to directly to Teams, go directly to Slack, go directly to, to um, the, the, the instant messaging people and say, look, this is what we want to do. Can you allow us to integrate with your platforms using APIs? APIs are application protocol interfaces, very simple ways of basically allowing two different systems to talk to one another and to share data. So the, the use case very simply is when I wake up in the morning uh, from uh, January 2021, I just need to switch on Lupul and all of my messages will be there in a meta-centric view. So I open up my Facebook matters, all my Facebook communications from clients will all be there. I want to speak to my clients because they like blue jeans. I click on, on chat and then we will chat. I will chat using Lupul. They will chat using whatever chat platform that they like. And that's the way in which we, we integrate using um, uh, Lupul. We, it's quite an exciting project. It's growing very, very rapidly. And right now we've got lots of different uh, people seeking to invest. But the core uh, three founding firms are Raja and Tan, CMS and Coolies. Um, I like that you can actually go to Microsoft and say, hey, yeah. let us integrate your teams into whatever thing. Yeah. <laughs> when you mentioned yeah, Facebook, uh, I think in case the class was not 
clear about it. Facebook is your client. Yeah, yes, yeah. Facebook is your client, but they want to communicate with you on Messenger, but some other people are communicating with you on email, and some other <laughs> people are communicating on WhatsApp, which is also a Facebook product, and some are communicating with WeChat, and what they're saying is that it can all come in one screen. Yes, it all comes in one that's screen, it. essentially. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what Loopal is all about. It's an example of how you can use technology to make life easier for us. And from a risk management standpoint, it, it creates what we know, what we call as a Canon folder. Because in every Loopal folder will be a meta approach, right? So you open each folder, it's like going back to the old days. It's something that maybe some of you will not be able to relate to. But for those of you familiar with old workflows, when we go into your office, we'll have five files for each of the matters that we're working on. You open file number one and everything is in there your letters, your documents from the courts, your correspondences with the counterparty, your, the minute, your, your minutes, your attendance notes, et cetera, for, for meetings, all in a single stack. So Lupal creates a single stack for every matter, drawing on all the information from the various um, communication platforms. So that is important from a risk management standpoint because in the future, if the client says, hey, I told you on this particular day at this time, using WhatsApp to file the document, what are you going to do? You're going to check your, your, your WhatsApp messages. It may or may not be there. It may have changed your phone. Yeah. Your notes may not be around. And you will be exposed from a risk management standpoint because clients say, I did. And they may have records of their own, uh, which may or may not be complete. So that's the reason why Loopal is key because it creates that canon folder that contains all of the records of all of these communications across multiple platforms. You can go to that, get your information, and then carry on. So that, that's, that's uh, the Loopal story. I just typed in the word Canon folder into the chat for those of, because, you know, they haven't gone for intern, internship yet. So, okay. cool. so guy, class, you know, this is an actual term that people use uh, in law firms because they're going internship next semester. In fact, some of them might be going to R&T. So if any of you go to R&T, please give shout out to the partner here. Huh? <laughs> this is exciting. What else? Yeah, so that, that's loophole. You know, apart from that, we've, we've launched ReadyDocs as well. That's another example of how we want to change the service delivery model for our clients. Uh, this is because today contracts are very hard to get done physically. So ReadyDocs basically uh, sets up about 20 odd precedents that are easily accessible. And we are targeting this for the SME and smaller markets just to make it clear that Raja and Tan is a big firm, but we don't just service big clients. We service clients across every strata. Um, and we truly do. We, we have our own uh, separate unit called Legal Basics that provides legal costs, legal services at a much more lower cost uh, for, for every kind of client that you can find out there. Um, and the funny thing is that some of our legal basics lawyers are some of the most profitable uh, partners within the wow. firm today. It's so, like budget airline. Uh. <laughs> so you got the, so your, your Raja and Tan is like your SQ, then you got, you got a, a budget legal airline basics. budget. <laughs> Something like that, I guess you could say, yeah. But the idea is, is to recognize the fact that there's no one size fit all for clients, right? In terms of accessibility, in terms of, of platforms. And that's why we created ReadyDocs also as another means of engaging easily with clients and giving them something that they can just use straight off the bat. So that's starting to gain traction now because together with ReadyDocs, you also get a subscription for RT Ready Sign, which is an e-signing platform, it's fully ETA compliant. I know it sounds like a salesman now, so I'll stop talking about ReadyDocs, but that's an example of, of how we are basically getting our lawyers to sort of change the, their perception of legal services also. At the end of the day, there are bespoke legal services which are key, going to court, you know, doing representation. That, and there will be certain parts of the legal practice that will get commoditized. The question is, as lawyers, we shouldn't somehow think that we are above all of this and this has got nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with law firms as well. And by ensuring we have these electronic platforms in place, we can still get the best quality work over to our clients in the most efficient uh, electronic means possible. So that's what ReadyDocs does. Um, it's there online. Feel free to download the app on the App Store and, and play around with it yourself. That's cool. And you know, since you mentioned, right, the lawyers having to change their mindset. No, you and I have been around long enough that we know that uh, <laughs> when we were not the most senior person in the room, oh, yes. it was not always easy to persuade the senior person. And because the class, mm. the class here, they are going for internship and they're going to be in future paralegals and junior lawyers, how can they help to mm. you know, persuade the more senior people who might be a little bit reluctant or yeah. afraid of technology? How do you think, we, what have you found helps? I mean, I found yeah. a few things, what have you found? 
Sure. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges and one of the things that people always throw up at me is, is the regulatory boundaries, right? Well, you got slides for everything. Like, oh. yeah, no, it's just it's serendipity, my friend. So, um, <laughs> regulatory boundaries is one of the biggest points that a lot of the senior partners say. I can't do it because the Legal Profession Act says, you know, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. It all has to be done properly the old way, the way in which it's done. And to some extent, they are correct, right? And I want to give them credit because they, they put people like, like you and I, in a sense, uh, on, the, on our toes to explain very clearly to the regulators why and when the laws need to change. And so that's the approach we took at Raja and Tan because, you know, it's correct to say that legal profession is, says things like, you know, there are restrictions on executive appointment. So I can't be the CEO of Raja and Tan Technologies, for example, but I can be a director. Is that good oh. enough? Yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. And we have, you know, other people doing the administrative work. There's no profit sharing with non-lawyers. That's another challenge also. If you say oh, to, your, to your bosses, look, I want to do cybersecurity, but my view of cybersecurity is not just legal, it's legal technology and everything else. Can we combine with a non-lawyer and go to market together? Answer is yes, you can. And to do that, you need to set up a separate private limited company. And that's the reason, reason why Raja and Tan Technologies was set up. Uh, setting up a company in Singapore is very easy thing to do. Just to give you an idea, right? When I set up RT Tech together with Steve Tan, my co-founder, uh, we basically had a $2 company set up and we got two desks at this uh, co-working space called Collision 8. Now it's known as Found 8 in High Street, right? So that was it. That was Rajanta Tech. And see, I used to go down and wipe the tables and things like that ourselves <laughs> and do things. It doesn't have to be a big deal. And setting up a company in Singapore takes a few hours. That's it. Uh, they, this one, they know because it's part, it was part of their group project for okay. all their subjects. Yeah, yeah. So you know how easy it is. So speak to your, your bosses that way to say that, you know, the thresholds in Singapore for doing this are low, but to challenge this particular regulatory boundary, even that has been challenged. Yeah? So we went all in on that. We spoke to the Ministry of Law. We told them about the need to establish these new lines of services and the need to move the regulatory boundaries to one which accommodates multi-skill, multidisciplinary team of lawyers. And Raja Antan Technologies basically has been set up today and is an embodiment of how our Ministry of Law is an enlightened ministry. And I must say that, and, and, and a lot of credit goes to the previous uh, PERMSEC, uh, Hao Ye, who's now moved on. And he was, is not a lawyer, but he's an engineer by training. And that's the beauty of our system, right? So we don't put lawyers everywhere in the Ministry of Law. And being an engineer, when he listened to our presentation, he was like, so what's wrong with this? And it's not that he didn't understand the law. Remember this, yeah, he is uh, in the Ministry of Law for an extended period of time. But he pointed to his civil servants and said, look, how does this in any way take us out from the core issue, which is not to bring the profession into disrepute? So we were like, whoa, okay. So it's not that this guy is an engineer, he doesn't understand the risk factors. He perfectly understood the Legal Profession Act and all the core principles. But his very simple proposition, which I was about to make and he actually took out of our mouth, myself and Steve, was I don't see any objection to this in principle because they're not setting up a karaoke bar. They're not, they're not doing something that, that will bring the profession into disrepute. They're setting up a company. The company is going to, going to do uh, non-legal work, yes, but it's non-legal work that is complementing legal services. Surely we must make space for this. And so, you know, if you do have these challenges as well, we are bosses saying cannot, cannot, LPA says cannot do, answer is that's not true anymore. The Ministry of Law is, is, is very much in favor of, of law firms adopting technology and doing all that it takes to monetize that technology. That's the other important thing to bear in mind. This is not a charity. This is a business case that you need to create using technology to make lawyers more efficient, be able to communicate more effectively with your clients and amongst ourselves with our other lawyers. The other thing that, that, that sometimes you know, people will raise and the bosses may raise as well is that it's a zero sum game, right? Legal tech companies are here, they're gonna take away our lunch. So why do you want to become like them? We should focus on ourselves and try to become better lawyers, right? And that's not true either because today legal tech entities have changed their tune completely, right? There have been a couple of high profile bankruptcies and insolvencies in legal tech companies that used to draw the line that we are here to replace law firms. That's no longer the case. I think the understanding now is that it's a symbiotic relationship between legal tech companies and law firms. And that's credit to the legal tech companies and also credit to law firms because they also realize that we need to embrace technology better, understand how these legal tech companies work and see how we can collaborate with them. So we look at some of the Raja Antan technology solutions. A lot of them are basically 
legal tech solutions uh, that are white label in some cases from, uh, from existing IT companies who do legal tech solutions. So things like our, our Novus Demia e-learning platform uh, is based on uh, uh, LMS, a learning management system created by a Singaporean company that is in the, in the, in the learning space. And they wanted to get into the legal tech space, but they found it didn't make sense for them to do it that way. Work with a law firm, get into the legal legal industry for e-learning by white labeling their platform. And this is something I take from my lessons, you know, being an active gamer. If any of you are do gaming, you know, uh, yes, no, Assassin, Odyssey, Super Any game. gamers, please put thumbs up in your, you know, go give them a <laughs> thumbs up, man. So, so if you, you do anything from, from the old days of Command and Conquer all the way until now, right, the point is, Every one of these guys work on the concept of an engine, right? Nobody builds an engine. You build on an existing engine. So Unreal, for example, is a very popular engine in the gaming sector. So whichever platform you're using, PUBG or whatever, it is all running on the Unreal engine. So the Unreal engine takes care of the physics, right? How you move, you know, how the, 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 the actual mathematics behind the world. But every company focuses on creating the world, their own content which sits on top of the engine. That to me is the perfect example of how technology and law sit together. You have the tech guys creating the mechanics and the legal guys applying their domain knowledge on top of it. It then becomes symbiotic. Both parties make money from this exercise and both are able to focus on their core strength, right? Enabling each other to, to, to profit and grow. That's really how legal tech will work for us. And that's basically how we structured Raja and Tan Technologies. Thanks so much, man. I know okay. that you've got a tight time schedule. So I just wanted to let you wrap up. Then we can maybe sure. take a couple of questions. Uh, some have already come up. Like Joshua Ng's got a question. And um, yeah. No worries. I mean, in terms of wrapping up, these are the services that RT Tech provides. E-discovery, contract management, which is a contract art, another version of, of a more advanced contracting platform. Uh, that sits at the, and complements our ReadyDocs platform. Cybersecurity has grown. Now we've set up a new company called Raja and Tan Cybersecurity Private Limited, which is a joint venture with another cybersecurity company uh, that's fully owned by Raja and Tan Technologies. Uh, that's going to be interesting. We are, our services are already being compared with uh, established players like Ensign and others. So that, that shows uh, how quickly we've come out from zero to, to essentially becoming some of the leading players in the, in the cybersecurity space. Uh, we have an e-learning platform called the, the uh, Novus Demia, as I mentioned before, and there's legal tech and then data breach readiness and, and awareness. So the team has grown quite a bit from the old days where right, just five of us to last year. This year, we can't take a group photo because of COVID-19, but you know, oh. I'll do something later. <laughs> and there's other people, myself, Steve, Onchi, and Michael, and lots of people have said nice things about us. And here's our solution. Uh, legal comment, contract arc, and Novus Demia. So that's it really in terms of the, just a quick, Excellent, man. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing all that. It's really exciting. No worries. Um, I'm going to go into the Q&A. What's the take-up rate for such apps, asked Joshua Ng? Do other companies express worries that the data input into apps get shared with R&T? Yeah. So the answer to, to both is, uh, firstly, it's, these are all brand new platforms. So the take-up has been, you know, from our standpoint, pretty good. Uh, we expect it to grow because of COVID-19. Uh, some of the platforms such as Novus, Demia, and ReadyDocs are growing very rapidly because of that. It's sad, but sometimes you know it takes a really ground-shaking event like this for people to understand the need to, to move into a digital plane. Uh, in terms of the issue of confidentiality and, and data sharing, our engagement model is key. So if you, for example, um, want to use the contracts in ReadyDocs, you will sign the terms and conditions, the use, user terms and conditions for the platform, but you also sign a letter of engagement with Raja and Tan. The moment you do that, then there's solicitor client confidentiality that's created as part of the relationship. And so we are then bound to keep that data confidential. Um, and that's, that's key. Uh, the one remaining part, of course, is access of that data by our service providers. And that's no different from us, for example, having physical servers and having someone doing the support and maintenance for those servers remotely. We enter into very specific service agreements with these individual organizations and they sign very tight data protection compliance requirements with us. And so no one has access to the data unless on a needs basis, for example, for disaster recovery purposes and things like that. And even then it is user instigated, not something that they can do on their own without uh, permission or consent from us. So it can be done, just a lot of extra layers that you need to build in. 
I'm glad you've thought of all those layers because that really answers a lot of questions that clients might have. Yeah, absolutely. Joshua, say, Joshua says thanks. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah. Oh, but good question as well. Yeah, good question. Kim Woon, are we uh, are we out of time? Um, uh, I think I think whoever can stay, some of them may have lessons, but uh, I think most of them who, who can stay will stay. Okay, right, but I, I'm going to hang out here yeah. for for another like you know, um, fifteen twenty minutes, no issue. Uh, um, Rajesh, I don't know whether you got time to. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to 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 hang about. Um, I think they might want to be interested in careers because uh, Benedict De Silva asked earlier about mm -hmm. the um, the difference in you know what do law firms look for in assessing ability. He was talking, I think, in generally about law firms, and mm -hmm. I think they all want to know about uh, career possibilities. Yeah, they're in the best place to answer that, right? Yeah, I mean, happy to share. And you know, like I mentioned earlier, the 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 what you're going to be assessed on will still be first and foremost your your traditional responsibilities right are you a competent lawyer so your 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 qualifications from an academic standpoint will still be an important consideration but in addition to that is all of these other things that i spoke about earlier things like technology literacy um, you know the ability to think innovatively and not just be someone who just does things based on instructions there will be a lot more uh, value being put on on those aspects uh, the pace of working has changed a lot. So, you know, your comfort level with technology will, will, will speak a lot to your ability to, to do things at the speed expected um, with, with, with um, the, the new technology platforms. But the good thing to know is that technology often helps, right? I mean, I didn't have time today to talk about our technology stack within Raja and Tan itself, but we have about 10 to 12 different products and solutions that help make life easier for our lawyers as well, in a sense. Those things are, are things that, you know, as a new lawyer, you, you come in and you'll be assessed in terms of your ability to use these platforms. For example, in due diligence, using Luminance uh, to speed up due diligence uh, with the artificial intelligence capabilities that Luminance brings. And that means that a lot of documents need not be automatically quickly scanned manually today. So if, if you're familiar with the due diligence process, right, when a company gets acquired, you'll send out a team of five lawyers to a data room. Uh, these days, there are virtual data rooms, essentially, as opposed to physical rooms. You will download the documents, read through them, and then you create a table saying, document data this, party A, party B, nature of documents, etc. Today, with Luminance, you don't need to do that anymore. Luminance will automatically scan OCR each of these documents, create that first set of, of uh, report. And that saves a lot of time so that lawyers can then jump straight into the more meaty parts of the due diligence, looking at the clauses, seeing the impact on the client's business, and things like that. So technology has, has really helped make it a lot easier. But again, you will be judged on, on that. So from a career standpoint, when looking at law, I think it'd be good if you spend a little bit of time looking at technology layer as well, just to understand how legal tech works and things like that. It will put you in very good stead. I also found that if I was sharing with them earlier, even if not explicitly stated, the paralegal or lawyer who is very comfortable with technology will find themselves working at a much more efficient and more effective yeah. rate than other colleagues who are not and you will basically shine in the firm. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, right now, um, the, the paralegal space is such an exciting one because there's also new jobs that are being created in areas such as legal engineering. So some of you may be familiar with knowledge and knowledge management, which is part of, you know, acquiring knowledge, managing the knowledge within the firm, managing the precedent bank and things like that. Legal engineering is one of the most exciting spaces that there is today. And a lot of times paralegals are being converted into that space in international firms. It's something that we want to seek to do also. So what is legal engineering? Well, legal engineering is about the process of understanding the practice of law and trying to bring in place technology and process innovation and improvements to improve the efficiency with which we are carrying out our work. So engineering is not just about tech. Tech is just one of the stacks that you look at. You basically spend a lot of time looking at the way in which work is done from a process standpoint. And so the focus is not on technology adoption, but on process re-engineering, right? Looking at the way in which the, the partners and the associates work today, is it the most efficient? Are there lapses, things like that? How can we address those? Looking at the way in which we communicate with our clients and saying, can that be re-engineered? So legal engineering doesn't mean you need an engineering degree. <laughs> Let me be clear first. It's about re-engineering the practice of law. 
that's what legal engineering is all about. So a very exciting space for paralegals and, and, and young lawyers to look at uh, in, in the near term. If I was a young lawyer today, that's exactly what I'd be doing. It's because you will still need your practice of law aspect, but this allows you to really get into the nuts and bolts of how practice actually works very quickly. And not just that, once you understand these nuts and bolts, you're then in charge of trying to make changes to those process. And that, that's particularly exciting. Right now, this, this is an ongoing process. So it's not something where you re-engineer and then that's the new normal, right? There's no such thing. I don't believe in this concept of new normal. There is no normal. We are in a constantly evolving state. But the point is to keep up with that changes, you need to be involved. You need to know the, in depth how exactly law firms work. So legal engineering is all about, about that. So do look out for that. That's really, really interesting, right? It's a whole different opportunities that are out there. And yeah. I think for the graduating class, uh, which this is a graduating class, it's just that, as Raja said, that it's constantly evolving. The job that you have in 10 years' time, maybe even five years' time, maybe something that we haven't even imagined yet. Yeah, I think, exactly. Rajesh, you and I, I mean, what we are doing now, we could not have imagined it when we started out. So true. Yeah, it's completely changed. I mean, there are some things I've written about how I think practice is going to be five, ten years. It's quite embarrassing, so I won't read it to you. Uh, but, you know, so it, <laughs> but it's changed completely. It's changed well beyond what we had expected it to. But in a good way, in the sense that, firstly, the core competency of a lawyer is still key, right? Problem solving. That's what we do best. And what we, the tools we use to solve the problem in our arsenal are the law, the law and our knowledge of the law. What's changing today is that in the arsenal of tools that we have is also technology, is also you know, um, technology, uh, other professionals that we bring in through our uh, affiliated services like Raja and Tan Technologies. So that, that allows us to give a much more holistic problem solving position and so greater value to clients. I say again, nobody's gonna pay you to give them a copy of the act or specific section. <laughs> All that is available for free. That's what Google is for. What you are valued for as a lawyer and what we should be charging clients for is solving a specific set of issues and problems that they have. And we need to be able to demonstrate that our skill sets in solving those problems are constantly evolving and getting sharper and deeper. That's why it cannot just be about the law moving forward for the for legal sector. There has to be law plus a multidisciplinary team of people in that affiliated space. Yeah, and that's really what we're doing with, in cyber security. But I'm just focusing too much on cyber. It affects other areas as well, like in shipping, for example. We are, we are creating a shipping app that helps us to, to adjust, to, to assess collision, ship collisions in a more, more accurate manner. This is purely technical in nature and something our shipping guys are very proud of. And you know, you probably read about it once we, we get it launched. That's the kind of thing where you take technology and you apply it to a sector-specific area. And then we bring in our clients as well, and they're super excited. Wow, this law firm really understands our concerns. And believe you me, until about three years ago, these things were basically done using pencil and paper. You draw line A, that's a path of ship A. Line B, path of ship B. Then the two lines intersect as a point of collision. I'm like, guys, that's like, you know, <laughs> the stuff that we learned doing basic programming, way, way, here you go, line A, line B, intersection. Yeah. So it's not rocket science to take that and turn it into an electronic, uh, electronic platform, which then becomes a lot easier for you to present to clients and lots more things can be done once the data is digitalized. So those are sort of uh, things that we're doing with different clients in different sectors. And you're, that's really amazing because everything that we do to, in law is presenting information, is yes. analyzing information, and that's where the technology is so powerful. Exactly. I think that's how you and I have found so many things. Like whether, even as we're presenting evidence for a trial, whether it's trying to present evidence to information to clients, just yeah. being able to have technological ways to do that really helps so much. Thanks so much for sharing all this, right? Now. And for the yeah. class, I mean, this is the Management of Law Office and Court Technology class, which is a very unique class in unique course subject in the Diploma of Law and Management. And, Domestic Poly. So uh, it's a real opportunity for the students to be exposed to legal tech and the opportunities that there are in legal tech. So I hope everybody in this class gets something out of this. And if you do, please do say hi in the chat. Um, I really want to thank my good friend Rajesh, Mr. Rajesh, no, no, no. for being here. <laughs> and, 
Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Yeah. Man. Um, we will officially close for the day and I'll hand back to Kim Woon but I'll leave the room open for a little while longer because one or two of you have been private messaging me and wanting to ask some other questions so but thanks so much Rajesh okay. I'll see you guys take care have a great week ahead. So thanks, Rajesh. can, can Thank we you. give a give yeah. a clap to Mr. Rajesh and, uh, <laughs> and Mr. <laughs> and Mr. Ang for taking the Virtual time clap. off wow the seriously <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, bye bye. Thanks all. Thanks, Rajesh. So, um, some of you, uh, Mr. Like Mr. Ang says, uh, some of you have uh, private messaged him. So, uh, Shamika, you, I think, a bit too late for Mr. Rajesh has left already. But you can also try Mr. Ang. He may have an answer for you as well. Uh, and I think actually this is a rare opportunity for for. Uh, that the two of them were, were able to share so much. Unfortunately, we only have an hour. So, but uh, like Mr. Ang says, he'll be he'll be here for 15, 20 minutes. Oh, okay, maybe not, but uh, he'll hang around for a little bit more. So do tap this. Uh, it's my it's my lunch break, so you know. Yeah. In, uh, you know, when you can. and management is very special to me. So, and my good friend Pang Kim Woon is here as the lecturer in charge. So I I was I was there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, okay. Benedict guys, asked a question in the open chat which was what's the difference between being in-house and being in a law firm and if you want to have a more corporate orientation to the job what's the better choice this is a very interesting thing and having experienced both I would say it's a real change of mindset right and then Kimu, I mean you can jump in also because you've you know from your experience what it's like because to me in the law firm uh you have to always prove yourself by adding value, giving value to multiple different clients. And if you are the kind of person who likes to try new experiences all the time, then you have different clients every time. Yeah, that's true. So it also gives you that ability to say that, okay, you know, I don't want to do more work for this client. I'm going to tell them I'm busy. Right? Which you can't do if you're in-house. If you're in-house, it's the same client every time. Which is good if you like the very st the stable kind of work because it's stable and you know that it's, the st it's one particular kind of work. I mean, there were, of course, businesses do change. So don't, don't sit there and hope that you can stay there till you retire. You know, life is going to change. But the, the in-house is a little more regular than the law firm. But having said that also, I know there are a lot of pressures now on in-house to um, do more work in-house rather than give it to law firms. And at the same point, law firms are also finding pressure that, wow, well, my regular client is now doing the work themselves instead of coming to me. Yeah. So that's pro and con. And I cannot say all in-house are like one kind because company to company changes. If you work for, say, uh, one of the big tech companies, the culture is totally different working for a bank. Bank is very conservative. You have to wear tie. Right? You see all the lawyers in the banks, all very conservative. All the lawyers in tech firms, you work as a lawyer in Razor, uh, which happens to be uh, CEO is a Raja Antan alumni also, Tan Ming Liang. Uh, totally different. Everybody wear black t-shirt. Right? So it's different cultures in different places, different law firms, different cultures also. But generally, that's one thing. Uh, yeah, Benedict, I, 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 I mean, the, the firm you join, the, if you go in-house and the firm you join also, like Mr. Ang says, uh, the culture is important before you join a firm. But I agree with him in terms of variety. Like if, you, if you want different types of work, with dealing with different clients, uh, some less irritating than others, some are uh, quite a joy to work with, uh, then you have that variety uh, uh, in the firm. Uh, in the in-house, you may not, uh, especially if you're in a smallish um, setup then basically your clients will be the same persons day in, day out. Uh, so I was in a smallish firm as well as a biggish firm. So with, with, at the MNC, you have many, you also have a variety of clients. Again, with different temperaments, di different degrees of uh, irrit irritability, no, irritatingness. So um, it also depends on which, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, M uh, in-house job you, you go to. Um, I guess one other thing I'd say is um, when you're in practice, you, you feel less 
uh, you don't know the business so well, although nowadays, uh, I think firms are expected to know their clients' business quite well, but obviously it's not as close as if you're, if you're in-house. So you're, if you're interested in the things that go on beyond the legal work, then the in-house environment will be, I mean, will bring you closer to the business, uh, and a little bit more non-legal stuff that you will learn and you'll be exposed to. Uh, remuneration, I guess, Mr. Ang. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it depends different? also la, because remuneration, right? Um, I I had a kind of like quasi offer from a large social media company whom I will not name, and what they were offering me was something around the like three to five times what I'm making now. But having said that, Rajesh probably makes. Position. Huh? Regional position. Regional position. Yeah, yeah. But then, on the other hand, Rajesh probably makes double of that, which would make it 10 times what I make now. So anyway, <laughs> so money is is very, uh, remuneration, hard to say. I mean, and some things money cannot buy. For example, um, you know, life. Um, but you have made a very interesting point, Akimun, because you really get to know the, the rest of the business. And in fact, I have four, three or four friends of graduated my batch, right, who started as in-house counsel and now are heading business units. Mm. They're actually, their job role, no, probably, no, there's five or six actually, who now head business units. They yeah. are no longer the legal department. They are running a different sector of the company now. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it is oh, a, it's a very that, good point. That's for your career. So that's for your career plotting. So if you see yourself as doing legal work or being a lawyer all your life, I think either works. But if you see yourself potentially branching out to doing something non-legal, like Mr. Ang says, his friends are doing, are actually heading business units. So you'd be surprised that some of the skills you, you have as a lawyer or paralegal uh, may very well be relevant in other, you know, other roles as well. So, um, it, I mean, it, especially if you are in a larger organization, it gives you the scope to actually move and do something else. So you can be in the same organization, but actually be doing different roles. So again, something that, that is very, very relevant to your generation because um, the one career and one employer, uh, you know, a career is uh, unlikely to happen now, nowadays for many of you. Right. Much less so for, for Mr. Ang and my, uh, my generation. Right. Yeah, I think there's an average of about probably seven careers that each body, every person is going to go through. Yeah. yeah. Did I miss out anybody else's questions? Um, the, uh, not to the general chat. So uh, for the private messages, I think maybe <laughs> you. But yeah. for the general chat, I think... Ben, does that answer your question? Benedict De Silva. Oh, Benedict, sorry. <laughs> Benedict said yes, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Ah, okay, yes. So Benedict, anyway, if you if there are things you want to ask our lecturers, we are available. But uh, again, rare opportunity with Mr. Ang. So whoever else is left here. Uh, most of most of class have has gone, but whoever else has left, then you have questions for Mr. Ang. Yeah, again, please feel free, right? Uh, assuming that they are not still here because they left their phone <laughs> on the table somewhere and they are actually somewhere else. Uh, uh good number of them probably not lah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the names. <laughs> I think the bulk of us are all from the same class who actually don't have lessons after this. Oh well, hey, thank you, Joshua. Nice to see. Nice to see you all. Yeah. Ordinarily, yeah. if I were in TP, I would like just hang out at the LP and then, you know, you all can just come and say hi, but yeah. Yeah, actually all of them are in my class, yes. Oh, I see. So, Nabila asked, uh, what, you is a question from Nabila. what is a startup law firm and what do you do there as compared to other firms? So, the, I was in startup twice. First was when we started up a law firm, which is actually just starting a new law firm. 
But in the old days, when you start a new law firm, what you do is you go and take your savings and then you go and go and get spend money and then go and renovate an office and then you must buy the dark wood furniture and then you must hire a secretary or receptionist, right? M Lock so Group that, Project. Huh? M Lock Group Project. M Lock Group Project, right? Yeah. So Kimura asked you, how many or how many actually decided to run a law firm out of a co-working space instead? Um, not that I can recall, no? Ah. Yeah. You know what is co-working space? Co-working space, you don't need to renovate because it's already done. The WeWorks, the what are that? Just Co, right? Oh yeah, actually one of my classmates is now the, the MD of Just Co. <laughs> can you, that's different, right? That's different from law, right? So, um, you, you don't need to renovate, you don't need to, you just pay the rent, you don't even need to hire a receptionist because they provide a receptionist. You got all your Wi-Fi all there already, all your, you don't need to set up a pantry because they got a pantry for you, right? You just go there, use the space. If you want a meeting, you don't need to think, should I build a four-person meeting room or an eight-person meeting room? What if I got 10 people coming? How do I have a meeting? Then the rest of the time, no, you don't worry because if you're in a co-working space, you just choose which meeting room you want to use. Right? So that's how law firms can start up now. You don't need to have the old way of oh, I don't know, doing things the old-fashioned way, all my dark wood. Then, ah, you see, the regulations have changed. So you can have, Nabila's very good question, confidentiality. Don't go and meet client and talk about client work and open up your files in the open space where everybody is sitting around. Where all the cool kids are there with the whiteboard and then drinking all the ideas and drinking their lattes, right? No, don't go there. Have your meeting room to meet with the client. Book the private rooms to do the private work. Many times, work from home. You only actually need an office space. This is from my personal experience. You only need an office space to meet the client. You don't actually need the office space to do the office work. Right? Because you could actually get it done until, until you build up enough money that you can actually spend and have an office and actually have people and staff to do other things. Ah, then you can spend an office. Until then, as a startup, you can use these shared spaces. And then you keep your stuff confidential. You use the lockers. Don't, don't, leave, your don't leave your files around. Having said that, nah, a lot of law firms, traditional law firms, also the lawyers and the paralegals are lousy at confidentiality. You go into the lift and then they're talking about client case. Uh, you know, uh, the client told me uh, that uh, don't tell anybody about actually they're having an affair, you know, with the uh, oh, you're in the you're in the lift saying please please don't don't say this don't 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 say it out loud, right? Or they carry the file right, then the name of the file right. You read the file title on the cover right, which very nicely your your did file covers right. Um, in the matter of the divorce of so and so and so and so, he was saying, wow, they're having a divorce, huh? <laughs> like, So confidentiality is something that you have to do yourself. You have to take care of yourself. The other one was I was a lawyer in a startup. And for that startup, basically, I had to now get legal work done, but with no budget. So I had to go and find all the resources that I could, which were as cheap as possible. And we didn't have money to go and get external lawyers. Like we, didn't have, we couldn't afford Raja and Tan, for example. So we had to figure out how we could get things done um, using technology. Uh, Nabila, did I answer the question? So anyway, to summarize for you, Nabila, uh, uh, the startup law firm basically is just a law firm, uh, uh, a law firm that was in Mr. Atan's case, four four person law firm. Lah. Okay, so it was just a new law firm, but he was also a lawyer in a startup that was not doing legal work. Yeah, just to clarify. Anyway, Nabila says yes. <laughs> All right, cool. So. Okay. I won't drag out if nobody else has questions. Okay. So, uh, anyway, uh, uh, so Mr. Hang, you, uh, you'll be answering the private messages, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, done, done already. Okay. 
done. Okay, so um, I, I also don't want to take up too much of Mr. Hong's time. He has very kindly uh, uh, spent another 50% more <laughs> than he agreed to uh, time with us. So um, uh, last chances for, for questions. If, if not, then uh, well, just, uh, should I, I should just pause, right? Yeah. Okay. okay.